and get going with the business portion of the meeting before we move on to the uh, declaratory ruling. So has everybody had a chance to review the previous minutes? Yes. Yes. Are there any questions regarding that? Hmm. Nope. Nope. So. Beautiful. Just to um, recap on the last meeting, we had Dr. Um, um, Michael uh, Fedorowicz from the National Board of Chiropractic Examiners talking about ethics and boundaries and uh, um, assessment services. Did anybody have any further follow-up questions? Um, I thought it was a great tool. That's something we might be able to utilize in the future, so that's awesome. The other thing I was going to, um, any other old business? No, just need somebody to uh, move to move, uh, approve the minutes. Jeff, I was going to ask a couple things on old business though before we move forward. Any, um, any decision on that acupuncture dry needling? No, nope, still waiting for still the waiting. commissioner. Yeah, we have it. There's a new uh, commissioner of the Department of Public Health, so uh, um, she's going to have to review it now and still waiting for that to happen. She just started a couple of weeks ago. Okay. And how about the, um, the, we haven't had an update in quite some time regarding um, cases pending, Jeff? I can do that for next time. Yeah, if we can just something in writing, just a quick update as to what's happening there, that would be uh, helpful, I think. Certainly. Um, Moving on to new business. Anybody have anything for new business? I think we, uh, yeah, we, we need first we need a motion to approve the minutes. Oh, I thought we did that. Did we have a motion? I thought we did that. No. I'll make that motion that we accept the minutes from the last meeting. Hmm. All Carmen in favor. We'll second. We'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 And the other thing, the only thing I have under new business, Jeff, is uh, I think we need to set the dates for the meetings for next year. Yes, we do. So uh, let me give you some dates and you tell me if they uh, work for now. We'll keep these at Thursdays at 9 a.m. Uh, how about uh, January 20th? Yeah, that That's, works for me. Sounds That's good not, for me as well. Okay, after that, uh, April 21st. Sounds good. Yes. Okay. Uh, then we can go either August or September. So if we do August, uh, how about the 18th? Right now, right now it works. For now it works. And then, okay, and then finally, uh, mm -hmm. we could do uh, November 3rd. Uh, that won't work for me. Uh, can we try November 17th? For that week, for that month? Sure. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. That's fine. So we're all set. Good. I'll just send a reminder email with this so you can all put them into your calendar. So we'll do January 20th, April 21st, August 19th, and November 17th. Very good. Awesome. Does anybody else have anything else for new business? Mr. Chair, I don't know if I could, but I attended the FCLB's District 3 and 5 meetings that happened in Jersey City. I could give a report on that now, or we can schedule something for a next uh, next meeting. It's totally uh, up. If you're ready for it, uh, let's do it now, Carlos. All right. Uh, so the FCLB's District 3 and 5, which Connecticut is part of District 3, met on, uh, in Jersey City from October 7th through October 10th. Uh, it, the meeting is actually was well attended considering uh, everything that's been going on. This was the first in-person meeting that occurred since the pandemic. Uh, and uh, there was originally started with some FCLB updates about the, cro the current projects and the um, financial report. From there, we had uh, presentations from NBCE, which the part, of, uh, part of that presentation included the EBOS. But also uh, the part four DIM project, which as you all have been notified, the part four uh, radiology component has moved to part three. Um, and also uh, one of the projects that the MEC is working on 
to update and upgrade the part for examinations. In fact, uh, what they have done, they have started working and consulting with the osteopathic uh, examining uh, boards to try to simulate or have a consultation with them. But that's a project that's happening on the NBC side. Also, uh, they were able to administer all the exams during the pandemic, which was a huge win. There were any student, anyone who wanted to take an exam, they were able to take an exam. So uh, no one was left behind. So that, was, that took a lot of effort on their part. And uh, what I'd like to do next and uh, talk about some of the roundtable discussions that we had as a group. Um, one thing I'd like to uh, maybe make a suggestion here is that um, as I'm going through these topics, it will be ideal if we could uh, maybe either have a future discussion or I don't know if maybe Jeff can help us out to relay as to when it comes to Connecticut, how are these issues handled? I mean, there's a, I'll just go through the topics, but you know, it's interesting when I attend these meetings, uh, I get to hear how these issues are handled in different jurisdictions. Um, so to the best of my ability, I try to bring information back for them. I do take information from them and I take notes as to what they're doing. But I don't know, at one point, uh, maybe uh, during these, either before or after these meetings, I would love to get an idea as to how are we handling these things in Connecticut. I have majority of them I know, but there are sometimes few topics I'm not sure about. Um, so, for instance, uh, one of the topics was how does your jurisdiction deal with addicted or mentally ill licensees? How does your jurisdiction handle compliance monitoring? What are your jurisdiction's requirement for documentation for maintenance or supportive patient care? If you have a licensee that has received public discipline, is that record public forever? Or is there some period of time that is allowed for it to be removed from a public record or expunged? Well, the answer to that one is it's permanent. Permanent, okay. Yeah. And I know that for, uh, for instance, uh, the addicted or mentally ill, I know that we received a, uh, there was a conference that happened in New Haven. It was a virtual conference, I believe, and we do have some uh, measures on that, right? I mean, how do you, how do you handle, you know, addicted or mentally ill licensees? What's the protocol for that in Connecticut? This is Mary. We have a, there is a, there's a program called the Haven program, right? Uh, which was enacted by statute a number of years ago, and that's for all healthcare professionals uh, licensed in Connecticut. And um, basically, that's a program where if the uh, uh, individual uh, participates in that, uh, they can go through the program for treatment and monitoring in lieu of any type of license discipline. Um, the caveat with that is if they should fail during the program, then their case is uh, transferred over to DPH and potential disciplinary action may follow that. Yeah. Okay. And if I, if I might, with all respect to the board, may I speak? Sure, go ahead. Lenhart, I do a lot of work with um, impaired practitioners, licensees. So they come into the system either by a patient complaint and they're at DPH and DPH offers the Haven program. Uh, some providers, licensees, actually do a voluntary um, uh, entry into Haven's program because they know they've got issues or it's softly motivated or it's highly motivated by another licensee or someone in the professional community who says, go to Haven or, or, or else. It might even be a strongly motivated uh, uh, referral to Haven by virtue of a mandated reporter. So there are a number of ways they end up at Haven. Now, Haven will work with these providers to get them resources in a structured program. It's generally a five-year monitoring program, although for some people it can be shorter. Um, and, and then the Department of Public Health is very willing to work through these issues with the, um, the participant, whether they can afford Haven because it is costly or they end up back at the department. The benefit of Haven is it's confidential 
and if everybody cooperates and they get through it, there's no public record of it. If they stay with the department because of um, an unwillingness or an inability to participate at Haven due to a financial issue, then they end up on either in a MOD hearing before the board or with a consent order and then they comply with the monitoring program under that consent order. So, um, so you know, it's, it's a complex process. The word to the wise to all chiropractors is that if they unfortunately end up in one of these situations, they should absolutely out question be represented by legal counsel because number one the reason they're being referred is there's a question of impairment it might be cognitive it might be due to substance use or alcohol use uh, but they need to have legal representation and there are a bunch of lawyers out out here who do this work and can help save and guide that person to a recovery path thank you thank you mary alice thank you Alice, what else yeah, so in, in our topic was, do you have a cap on yours for disclosure of felony or other criminal conduct? Example, if you have a nonviolent felony, does it have to be disclosed more than five years, 10 years ago? How long ago is that? I believe in the application process, um, there is a question concerning a felony conviction, and I don't know if there's any time frames. There isn't. There isn't? Uh, no, I've never seen one. Okay. And then we had discussions about how is the jurisdiction rebounded from COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously, you know, uh, I've always had a tremendous amount of respect for the team at the DPH, the work that you've done. And so I relate to that. And I think uh, we as a board, with it good. We've been staying virtual, obviously. Um, and then how, does your, how do you engage with the licensees? And uh, I think, uh, Mr. Chair, we had talked about potentially doing something at the University of Bridgeport a while ago, but obviously the pandemic happened. So I know that other boards uh, at times they do have they help they hold their meetings at chiropractic college sometimes or uh, or they have um, you know some sort of a uh, I guess a they have a presentation or a seminar to sort of uh, bridge the gap and make sure the licensees have a better understanding of regulatory issues. So, and I'm not sure again what we do here in Connecticut. I, for as long as I've been on the board, we haven't really had any type of an engagement with licensees directly. Yeah, well, we really haven't. The only thing I encourage uh, Kairos all the time is to go to the uh, website, pull up the minutes from the previous meetings and to evaluate those. Um, we haven't engaged publicly in any of them. Uh, and then uh, we discussed uh, telehealth as to what changes have you seen in regulating telehealth for licensees? Um, again, I know that some chiropractors are utilizing telehealth, especially in VA, for the initial consultation, uh, maybe a portion of uh, the very initial visit, uh, or even uh, through instrumentation, maybe doing some range of motion analysis or gait analysis. Those are some of the things that are being discussed um, in other jurisdictions that are being applied. Uh, I have uh, not, I do not know of any chiropractors in Connecticut that are doing telehealth, as if at least I haven't heard anything. So. Um, that was my response to them. Yeah, I've, I've actually heard of a few. Um, a lot of them are doing uh, functional medicine aspects um, in that regard. So, you know, not active, traditional chiropractic. I don't want to hate to use that term, but it's more from a functional standpoint. I've heard a lot of those. Yeah. And then, of course, the idea of how does your jurisdiction define chiropractic specialties? Um, that's a concern that's out there. Again, we've talked about this, how you could have someone attend a weekend course and get a certification and call, them, and, you know, call themselves a specialist. So trying to bring some quality as to you know, what defines a chiropractic specialist. So there was a very healthy discussion on that. Um, and uh, a couple other things in here. How does your jurisdiction define corporate ownership of chiropractic clinics. Um, so I understand that uh, there are some jurisdictions that a non chiropractor or a non physician or non licensed provider can own a healthcare uh, facility. And uh, 
I am, uh, I'm almost certain that this, that's the same case here in the Connecticut. Um, those are legal questions I really don't have the answer to. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would and, just uh, say it depends on the uh, structure of the organization, and it's really mm -hmm. got to be viewed by counsel that do uh, you know, business law. And then, uh, how does your jurisdiction schedule, has your jurisdiction schedule review of outdated language in your rules or regulations? You know, again, some jurisdictions have sunset uh, rules where every five years or every 10 years they have to go and look at their rules and regs. And obviously that's something that doesn't apply to us. And uh, the last thing was medical marijuana for chiropractors. You know, again, uh, it's, uh, I know a lot of jurisdictions that's not allowed uh, because of uh, class two uh, classification on their FDA, but actually, obviously that's something that's, you know, still changing. Um, last is just a reminder that the annual conference for the FCLB will be held uh, next year, May 4th through 8th in Denver, Colorado. And uh, the district meetings uh, also, will, the information for that will be up on the website. All right, that, uh, again, it was a very healthy meeting, very healthy discussion. Mm -hmm. I always uh, enjoy attending these and reporting back to the board as to what our jurisdictions are doing. And hopefully this continues bringing value to the group here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Carlos, uh, you just a thought for a future topic, which I'd like to see. Uh Discuss and curious as to what other states are doing regarding um, chiropractic assistance. Yes. The status is in different states. Ah, uh, yeah. So uh, it's it's again it's uh, actually those topics are always coming up uh, as you know as we discuss this in depth uh, in our own board is that mm -hmm. some jurisdictions are licensing CCAs, some have mm -hmm. uh, been able to at least define. Uh, under the uh, medical assistance uh, statute or medical license policies as to what is a chiropractic assistant able to do. Maybe you have a list of duties they can do, whether it's gathering general health information or uh, maybe uh, uh, you know using instrumentation for vitals or posture and so on and so forth. So, uh, Mr. Chair, yeah, this is a these discussions are constantly happening. Uh, so I'm I'm happy to put it, put it back on their agenda, report back. But again, there is a it's it continues to be that chiropractic assistance are uh, you know obviously not delivering any type of care, or making diagnosis, rendering diagnosis, or anything like that. But they are in the office and they're they're able to provide general health information to the patients. Uh, but again, some jurisdictions have licensed their CA. So. This is a discussion that we've had, and we can maybe set some time to discuss more about it. Carlos, thank you for the update, and uh, thanks for all your hard work and participating with that group. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything for new business? If not, I'll take a motion to adjourn and uh, move on to the next portion of the meeting. Make the motion that we adjourn this meeting. I'll second mm -hmm. that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, all right. Call this meeting adjourned. Let's move on to uh, the declaratory ruling aspect with Dr. Siegel. Okay. Uh, Mr. Dixon, court reporter, ready? Um, ready to go. Okay. All set. Go ahead, Candy. All right. Thank you. Um, just a reminder of how we got here. Our last meeting was on August 19th. And at that time, we um, had the meeting for the declaratory ruling as to whether um, I want to read it verbatim. Somewhere here in my notes, here it is. Whether the use of the um, Mesuscope uh, Neo medical devices within the scope of practice for licensed chiropractors in the state of Connecticut. We had submitted and uh, requested some information from all parties in concern. And um, unfortunately, we received a lot of that information came in late. Uh, we actually received the information on um, 
uh, August 18th, which was the night before our hearing. So we as a board decided to extend that deadline to give Dr. Siegel an opportunity to uh, send in some additional information. And he was kind enough to do that. So at this point, I'd like to um, kind of roll over to Carrie and see where we stand and how we're doing with that. Okay, so before we begin, let's have all the panel members identify themselves for the record. And just for the record, I'm Carrie Coulson, Assistant Attorney General, and I'm here today mm -hmm. to advise the board. And I'm Candy Carocha with the uh, Board of Examiners. Carlos Bogosian with the Board of Examiners. Mm -hmm. Gina Carucci, chiropractic member of the Board of Examiners. Dr. Robotham, chiropractic member of the Board of Examiners. Mm -hmm. Okay, and let's have the parties identify themselves. Hello? You, you can start, yeah. Attorney Lenhart. <laughs> Mary Alice Moore Lenhart for the Connecticut Chiropractic Association. Thank you. Dr. Siegel, would you identify yourself? Uh, yes, Dr. Alan Siegel, uh, licensed chiropractor, state of Connecticut. Okay, thank you. Um, so Dr. Siegel, um, we have a few things we should talk about entering exhibits. First, there's a board exhibit that should be entered. Jeff, do you have a copy of it to pull it up on the screen? Just so everybody can see it. Certainly, one second. Okay, so the exhibit is a notice of continued hearing and I can't actually see. Jeff, what's the date on it? August 24th. August 24th, 2021. That would be entered as board exhibit 13. Do, do either of the parties have an objection to that being entered? Attorney Lenhart? I think you're muted. Sorry, no objection. Okay, Dr. Siegel. No objection. Got it. Okay. So the notice of continued hearing. Last name that's very important. We're probably somebody's probably trying to circumvent us. Um, I'm sorry, Attorney Lenhart. Mary Alice, were you saying something there? We caught the tail. No, I'm. All, I, I'm sorry. I'm. All set. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that the notice is entered as board exhibit 13. Is that correct, Jeff? Because we left off on 12. Yes. Okay, so that will be entered as board exhibit 13. Okay, mm -hmm. Next, we receive some exhibits and pre filed testimony. Um, from Dr. Siegel. Um, Attorney Lenhart, did you receive copies of the pre-filed as well as the attached exhibit? Yes, I did. Um, Attorney Lenhart, would you have any objections to them being entered at this point? No objections. Okay, so let's go through and we'll 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 take those up right now. And I, I hear a dog barking in the background, so if people aren't speaking, I would just ask that they're they're um, they mute themselves. Okay, so um, let's let's swear Dr. Siegel in at the beginning and have him adopt his pre-trial um, pre-file testimony. Dr. Siegel, would you raise your right hand? Do you so swear or affirm, as the case may be, that the evidence and testimony you shall present will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God, or on pains and penalties of perjury? I do. You are so sworn. For the record, would you just please state and spell your name? Alan Siegel, A-L-A-N-S-I-E-G-E-L. Thank you so much. Mm. 
OK, Dr. Siegel, I'm going to help you out since you don't have legal counsel and you haven't done this before. Um, so the board received what you entitled a pre-hearing evidence submission, and it was, I believe, filed by you on August 25th, 2021. Is that correct? Correct. Um, Jeff, could you just pull up his pre-filed so we can have everybody can see what we're looking at as we're going through them? Thank you, Jeff. Um, and is it your intention today to adopt your pre-filed testimony as your testimony in this proceeding? Uh, I would say yes, if, if that's the question. Yeah, to go through all this with that with the board. Yes, we want to know if you're adopting your pre-filed testimony yes. today. Okay, oh. great. So why don't we enter um, the pre-hearing evidence submission as um, Dr. Siegel's Exhibit A. Attorney Lenhart, you, you have no objection as we're going through these, correct? No objection. Okay. Mm. All right, so then let's go through what the attachments were so we can identify them and have them entered as well. So the first one that I have in my packet it says Multiscope Science H-I-F-E-M. And it looks like it has various um, parts to it. So the first one says science. The second says clinical overview. The next says what's new in 2019. And then the last page says thank you. And it's for a total of 29 pages. Would you like to enter, have that entered as an exhibit, Dr. Siegel? Yes. Okay. And Attorney um, Moore Lenhart, no objection, correct? No objection. Okay, we'll enter that as Dr. Siegel's exhibit B. Um, the next uh, document I have is a July 5th, 2019 letter from the FDA, the U Fed FDA U.S. Food and Drug to BTL Industries. Is there an attachment to that letter, Dr. Siegel, or is that just a two-page document? Is I'm sorry, what, repeat the question. Is there a... Is there an attachment to that, or is it just a two-page no, document? Just no, that's a, that's its own document. That's a um, that's a response letter from the FDA to the manufacturer. Okay, so we can mark that as respondent. I mean, Dr. Siegel's Exhibit C. If there's no objection from Attorney Moore Lenhart. No objection. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next document I have is a department. Well, I'll ask you to identify it, Dr. Siegel. What is that? Uh, I need to see. Uh, okay, so this is a uh, this is a predicate device um, for the Emsculpt Neo. Uh, you know, when you when you go when you have device manufacturing, you know, you have devices and you have predicate devices. This is a just a predicate device to give more background and information about the, the device, the origin, the technology, the indications of use for the device, um, and uh, the efficacy and the safety of that device from its, you know, from its uh, orig origination, I guess is the best way, best way to put it. Okay, so this is from the Department of Health and Human Services, and it says indications for use and it references device K19046. Is there, um, I take it you want to enter this as an exhibit? Yes, please. Okay. And attorney Moore, Lenhard, any objections? No. Okay, that will be exhibit D for Dr. Siegel. Okay, the next document that I have, it says BTL Industries 5, 10K summary and it says K190456. It's a six page document. Um, Dr. Siegel, do you want to identify just what this is? 
Uh, yes, this is the uh, the summary uh, submission to the FDA on behalf of BTL Industries, who's the manufacturer of the device, um, uh, as they were going through their pre-market clearance. Okay, so we'll give you a chance afterwards. You can go through and you can provide whatever testimony or explanation you want about the documents and attorney. More Lenhart may cross examine you and the board may have questions. So right now we're just trying to get this all in as evidence. So thank you for assistance. Yeah, so course. that will be marked as department exhibit E. I'm sorry, I take that back. Dr. Siegel's exhibit E. Okay, the next document I have is from the US, the FDA US Food and Drug Administration to Mr. Stephen Sank regarding it says Ray K19254. It's a two page document. Um, would you like that entered as exhibit F, Dr. Siegel? Uh, yeah, yes, I can explain why I submitted that, but um, I could do that later. If it okay, does. we'll give you a chance. Um, okay. Attorney Moore Lenhart, do you have any objection? No objection. Thank you. Um, Attorney Moore Lenhart, can I just assume with respect to all of these documents, you have no objection and we'll just go through them and enter them? That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. OK, so the next document that I have is up on the screen. It says Department of Health and Human Services, Food and Drug Indications for Use, and it's K192544. Dr. Siegel, just briefly, can you identify what this document is? Uh, yes, that was just a, a device um, that I was trying to demonstrate uh, comparative use uh, in clinical settings within the chiropractic community. Uh, uh, surely within the state of Connecticut for similar devices that have similar indications of use um, that are currently being used in the uh, the marketplace and in, in scope of practice in Connecticut. OK, so that will be entered as Dr. Siegel's Exhibit G. It's a one page document. The next document I have is it's at the top of it, it says K192544 dash dash five, 10 parens K parens summary. Dr. Siegel, could you just identify for the record what that is? Uh, again, that's another pre market uh, summary uh, from a manufacturer uh, submission to the FDA uh, describing the device. And again, this particular device was only for comparative purposes not for um, specifically for, you know, approvals because uh, it's already being used in the marketplace, so. Okay, so that will be entered as um, Dr. Siegel's Exhibit H and it's a seven page document. The next document I have is an FDA US food and drug letter dated January 26, 2021. Dave Schemmel, C-H-M-E-L, Vice President of Operations. It's a two page document. Would you like that entered as your exhibit I? Dr. Yes, Steve? please. Okay, so entered. The next um, document I have is a Department of Food and Human Services Food and Drug Indication for Use for K202199. Could you just briefly identify what that is, Dr. Siegel? Uh, yes, this is the uh, indication of use for the MSculpt Neo. Okay, so would you like that to be entered as your um, Exhibit J? Great, thank you. Yes, so entered. Okay, the next document I have at the top it says BTL Industries 510 paren K paren summary general information um, in the sponsors BTL Industries Inc. Yeah, that's it. Um, Dr. Siegel, just could you kind of what this document is? Uh, this is the uh, pre market submission from the manufacturer to the FDA 
for pre-market approval. Okay, would you like that to be entered as your exhibit K? Yes, please. Okay, so entered. <laughs> Next, I have an FDA US Food and Drug Administration July 9th, 2021 letter to BTL Industries Inc. Would you like that to be entered as your exhibit L, Dr. Siegel? Yes, please. Okay, so entered. Okay, next, there it is. That's my next exhibit that I have. It says Department of Health and Human Services, Food and Drug Administration Indications for Use. It identifies it. The number for K21107. Could you just briefly identify what that document is, Dr. Siegel? Uh, yes, that's the uh, FDA um, uh, final 501k clearance uh, indications of use pre market. Yeah. Okay. And would you like that to be entered as your exhibit M? Yes. Okay. So entered. And this should be the last one that I have. It says BTL Industries on top, 510 Prince, K Prince summary. Um, the sponsor is BTL Industries Inc. It's a seven page document. Um, could you just briefly identify what that is, Dr. Siegel? Uh, yes, that's the manufacturer's um, pre market submission to the FDA uh, to uh, review for. Uh, FDA 501k clearance. Okay, and would you like that to be entered as your um, your exhibit N as in Nancy? Yes, please. Okay, entered. Okay, so I believe that all um, of the evidence that you had submitted, Dr. Siegel, are we missing anything? No, thank you. Okay, great. So. Now is your chance to make a statement to the board regarding your petition for declaratory ruling, and you can have a chance to discuss any of the exhibits that you have entered, as well as the pre-filed testimony that you have filed. You will probably get questions from maybe me or the board members, and Attorney Lenhart will have an opportunity to cross-examine you as well. Okay, terrific. Uh you want me to start? Please. Okay, great. So uh, thank you again um, for the board and everyone's time for uh, you know allowing me to go through this process. Uh, again, my uh, reason for uh, presenting this today is to make sure that I am in compliance with Connecticut state law of practice and uh, I do not wish to uh, be in non-compliance. So uh, I appreciate everyone's time. So. Um, I think, as we know, like um, chiropractic uh, it, as a pra practice, uh, you know, varies from state to state, but we're dealing with the state of Connecticut. So we're going to focus on the state of Connecticut here. Um, uh, basically, the purpose of, of this presentation is to determine if this particular device, the M-Sculpt Neo, is appropriate and of legal use in the state of Connecticut under the chiropractic license. So I'll we'll just make that very clear, uh, try and keep it simple. Um, I think a couple of things with um, regards to scope of practice that we could talk about to start is that, um, uh, you know, that we're dealing with, uh, you know, not that I need to read the scope of practice, I'm sure everyone knows it, but I'll read it anyway. Uh, Practice of chiropractic means the practice of the branch of healing arts, consistent of the science, adjustment, manipulation, and treatment of the human body, in which vertebral subluxations and other malpositions, articulations, and structures may interfere with the normal generation, transmission, and expression of nerve impulse between the brain, organs, and tissues, which may be of cause of disease, are just manipulated or treated. So, you know, as far as applying, um, devices uh, to the body like uh, Russian stim or diathermy or other modalities that are being used in the profession now as well as low level laser therapies. Um, they all have various physiological effects on our body and we can debate and talk about those for, for quite some time about you know how they relate to chiropractic and the scope of practice but um, 
the, the bottom line is that they're they are utilized for various purposes for for pain reduction for uh, uh, having a positive uh, health impact on, on our patients. Um, under uh, 2027 uh, of the uh, scope of practice laws here, it says treat the human body by manual, mechanical, electrical, meaning a big a part of this electrical or natural methods, including acupuncture, or by use of physical means, including light and heat. Uh, heat would be another part of this technology, which we're going to address. So electrical is one and heat is another. So when you're dealing with electrical impulses and, um, and heat, those are the two components of this therapy that make a physiological effect on the patient that we're trying to treat. So, um, so I just want to bring that to everyone's attention as well as we go through this a little bit. Um, so I think... The bottom line for this treatment is, is how does it relate to our patients? And, and I think as a chiropractor, you know, first and foremost is, or any health practitioner is, is do no harm, right? So we never want to indicate or bring into any type of uh, procedure or device or modality that would potentially cause harm. And I think, can I share my screen? Is that possible? Um, Dr. Siegel, so right now, all you can, if it's an exhibit that has been entered into this proceeding, you can have it pulled up and we can take a look at it. But if it's something that is not part of the record so far, then no, you should not be showing it to the board. Yeah, no, it, it is based on what has already been submitted. Yep. So I, what exhibit would you like to be pulled up and we'll pull it up for you? So you, you could start with, um, I think. I think it was, I tried to document them as you were entering them, but I think it was C. Um, uh, it was just the, the initial science of the m -Skull. So I have C as a July 5th, um, 2019 um, FDA US and food drug letter to BTL Industries. Is that what you're looking for? No, it was more about the, the slides. Uh, it said m and I think it said science underneath that's, it. That's B. That's B. B as in boy. Oh, B as in boy. I'm sorry. Okay, maybe I missed. Okay. And so we'll ask um, Mr. Cardis to pull that up for us. Is it? This is what you're referencing, Dr. Siegel. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. you you're welcome. If we can, if we can just slowly scroll through this, um, or get to at least the second page here. I, this is why I assume like the board has had a chance and uh, council has had a chance to at least review some of these at, at some point. So, so basically, um, this is uh, one of the basic premises of the of the uh, of the treatment. Um, it is a low frequency wavelength, uh, as you can, as everyone can kind of read this here, um, and it is uh, basically. Uh, electromagnetic low frequency. I'm not an expert, you know, so I'll say that right on, on waves and frequencies and, and, and uh, electro uh, stimulation, but uh, we can probably all safely say that this has been used in our profession widely for decades and decades with, with very um, uh, minimal, you know, negative effects. Um, the purpose of this uh, is to strengthen muscle, to tighten muscle, to increase muscle mass, reduce percent body fat, BMI, strengthening of core muscle work or other muscles. Um, this particular device, if you scroll down to the next page, please, um, shows you the contractual ability of the, of the device in order to create more muscle through these contractions, and um, and uh, you know the, the best thing I can relate to that would be commonality would be if you thought about like Russian stim and how Russian stim is used in in, pr in practical settings for rehabilitation and for strengthening of, of muscles that have been uh, hypertrophied through neurological deficit or other uh, uh, clinical you know uh, ways, but. Um, that this is a way to increase muscle, increase strength, increase lean body mass, uh, 
uh, and it can be done near the abdominal area, the core area, uh, and in the gluteal area where we know uh, weaknesses can occur. If we go to this next page, that'd be great. Um, here is just a quick little diagram of, of, of the muscle growth. It says uh, hypertrophy, not hyper, uh, hyperplasia. And then um, what happens in, in effect to that muscle growth, uh, you'll have a reduction in, in fat. So um, that's pretty self-explanatory. I don't know if there's any questions on this, but are they going to ask questions later or we're just going to go through this right now? All right. I'm sorry, ahead. I was muted. You could feel free to make your presentation. You might get interrupted by some of the board members if they have some questions or by me. And then once you're finished, Attorney Moore Lenhart will ask you any questions that she has and the board may then as well too. I do have a question as a point of clarification from the previous slide. I just want to make sure I understood you correctly. I think you were stating that the device was being utilized to bring hypertrophy to a muscle that had been previously atrophied. Did I, is that correct? Uh, yeah, well, it, it increases muscle contraction, which would, it doesn't have to be for a hypertrophied muscle, but it can surely be for a hypertrophied muscle. Yes. So you're saying, again, I want to be clear that you're using it on a muscle that might have been atrophied or weakened from injury or trauma so that you can get hypertrophy or enlargement. Is that correct? Correct, except for it doesn't have to be from an injury or a trauma. It can okay. be from just, just weakness of disuse. Okay, so like it like, is more for an atrophy to hypertrophy. Not You're not gonna already use it on a hypertrophied muscle. No, unless there's a, a clinical need for someone to get stronger in that area. Right, okay, just want clarification, thank you. Yes. All right, if uh, we can scroll back down, I think it's the slide. Yeah, it's a little bit hard. Uh, I should have printed these in front of me, but I apologize. I thought I was going to share my screen, but um, all right, this is just showing some uh, research showing the effect, the efficacy of the treatment that it is doing what we're asking it to do, which is increase muscle mass and density. Um, and uh, and uh, increasing muscle thickness uh, to the areas that's been applied to. Um, we can kind of continue going down here. Uh, keep keep going down. This is just some side effects that will happen to fat in the area when when muscle increases, fat decreases, and it's showing that that's been a side effect of the treatment that uh, percent body fat and basic you know adipose will dissipate in the area of the treatment because the muscle is becoming leaner and stronger and more efficient uh can we keep scrolling down here i don't have to go through all of this i think everyone's had a chance to look at some of this but um we keep going down here are some journal entries that surely can be reviewed uh about um the frequency electromagnetic that we're discussing. And we can scroll down a little bit more here. These are just some more studies, keep going. These are individual studies, we can stop. Uh, these are a little bit hard to read, I apologize. I don't know why these were so, I don't know if we can enlarge this at all. So the one thing I want to indicate again, if I didn't make this clear, is that this is a 100% non-invasive, non-subcutaneous treatment. There is no effect, uh, as you'll see from some of the other devices, on on any skin types. Uh, there's no uh, perforation of the skin. There's no bleeding. Everything is uh, uh, above um, the cutaneous uh, area. So the application is 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 uh is dermal and and that's it there's nothing else um this is just some indications of bmi profiles 
uh, patients that had significant abdominal changes, strengthening in the abdominal region, which, you know, you know, part of the process of using this for patients can be beneficial clinically. You know, we can go on and on and on why this would be beneficial, but, you know, for starters, people with low back pain, number one, people with excessive body weight and with excessive body fat with uh, weak core muscle muscles, we know clinically over and over and over again uh, leads to, you know, can lead to low back pain. Uh, there have been studies and studies and studies showing people just when they lose weight or they tone their bodies and their core muscles are stronger, their back pain, a lot of chronic back pain goes away. So, and we're not here to discuss, you know, hundreds of studies that have shown that, but, but when you're trying to correlate the scope of practice with why a technology like this should be applied, you know, that's a very basic core uh, argument that I would say um, is very logical and sensible in, in my opinion. So um, so we can go through all these studies, but I think they all show the same thing that there's an increase in muscle strength, there's a decrease in uh, local adipose tissue because of the increase in the muscle toning and the lean fiber masses of the muscle. Um, we can keep scrolling down here. Uh, just more studies, you know, uh, again, pretty much showing all the same clinical positive effects here. Um, we can keep going. Uh, can I ask a uh, excuse me, Dr. Stephen, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. So your primary primary clinical indications for the use of this product or this device is what? Again, just please reiterate that for myself. Your primary clinical ind indications for the use of this product is what? would be uh, if, if a patient with chronic pain or low back pain, all right, would benefit from increased core muscle strength, I would apply this device. And your primary end Could result? The last... I'm sorry? Could sorry. the questioner just themselves? I apologize for the interruption. I'm sorry, was there a follow-up question or? Just have the uh, yeah. questioner identify. I'm uh, sorry, Dr. Sean Robotham, that I asked the previous question. Is that good? Are we good? Yeah, Sean, did you have a follow-up to that? Uh, yeah. Um, what's the primary marketing uh, agenda with this particular device? Are we marketing this for uh, core strengthening or are we marketing this for weight loss? Uh, I'm not marketing it in, a, in any way. I, I, I would use this clinically in my office as it, as it deemed fit for my patient population. Dr. Siegel, Thanks. how is it marketed? I think that's what the question really is. Do you know how this device is typically being marketed? Well, in terms of the manufacturer, I can't speak on their behalf. You know, I know that there, there are different uses potentially like some people like look not anyone has pain but maybe want a more toned abdomen or a stronger abdomen right but they may not be in pain they may not be seeing a chiropractor so maybe uh that this device is being applied in in or marketed in a different fashion but from a clinical perspective you know like i said i would apply this to my patients as it was clinically appropriate to my patient population. And you said it may be marketing in a different fashion. What fashion is that? Uh, uh, maybe more uh, in a um, aesthetic way, if that's uh, the appropriate word, more aesthetically. Uh, I know in, in various states, um, uh, various practitioners are using the, these devices for uh, various clinical, you know, means. I, I think the only way to say it is like, yeah, probably aesthetics. That would probably be the best word. Yeah. So, Mr. Chair, Carlos Pagosian here. I have a question. Um, again, I want to clarify this if I just so I have a better understanding. Dr. Siegel, are you saying that this device, there is a possibility? that a licensed chiropractor in the state of Connecticut might use this device and market it for fat loss? 
is that is that something that could happen because of the fact that's used for fat, fat loss or aesthetic reasons what i'm saying is i would not do that if that was not in the scope of practice or in the scope of the law for chiropractic i understand not you but i'm saying if this def this def this device is if the licensed chiropractor is able to utilize this de this device because of the fact there are studies that shows that this could be used for fat loss is it are you think are you saying that that's one of the one of the benefits of this device could be used aesthetically for fat loss or uh, cosmetic reasons is it some that other healthcare providers are doing that you know of that use this device for those reasons i i believe other other practitioners may be using it for that reason uh, which allow them to do that under their scope but what i'm saying is a chiropractor I would only market and utilize this as deemed fit for my patient population. And I can only equate this to like, you know, just in general, and this is something, you know, not totally related, but, you know, nu nutrition is allowed to be utilized in chiropractic scope of practice. And there's a lot of different types of nutrition that is marketed for various reasons in the state of Connecticut, as well as other states that, you know, may or may not fall under, you know, the scope of practice, but yet it's still marketed, whether it's a keto pill for weight loss. And I mean, you know, I don't, I, I don't know the answer to this, so I'll ask the question. I don't know if this is the appropriate, but, you know, is, is diet and nutrition and weight loss, you know, a part of scope of practice for chiropractic in the state of Connecticut? Oh, Dr. Seagal, I'll answer that for you. Um, it is, and it is because um, of the effects that it has on the central nervous, peripheral and central nervous system. If you can control sugar levels, for example, in somebody who's diabetic, um, nutritional counseling would be um, certainly within the scope of practice to increase physiological nerve function. Okay. okay, I appreciate that. So, so my argument would be, similarly, you know, I think clinically we can all agree with with one hundred percent certainty that reduction in BMI, reduction in percent body fat, reduction mm -hmm. in, um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to use the word hypertension because we're not treating hypertension, but all of these things clinically have a positive neurological effect on our patient population. So if we are, if we look at a whole person, a whole body of, of, of what's going on, a patient walks in your door, they have hypertension, maybe they have heart disease, they have back pain, you know, we're treating the back pain, but we're treating them physiologically for, you know, their neurological system. And we know that diet, nutrition, and percent body fat loss is, a positive effect physiologically on their body, then why would we not use a modality that can help them in that positive manner, safely, effectively, and without the use of drugs and surgery? Dr. Siegel, let me, let me um, just tell you what I'm thinking here out loud. Um, I have no doubt that by stimulating electrically those muscles, you are driving receptors, you're driving peripheral nerves, you're driving the spinal cord, you're even driving the brain. There's no effort for the if answer bots, and you'll see changes cortically throughout. Um, my problem is you have, um, I don't understand the physiology as to how this is decreasing adipose tissue. Well, I think the studies can kind of help us go through that so well they really don't explain that though they all they do is they talk about percentages of decreased body fat or decreasing bmi but it really doesn't explain to me physiologically how applying electrical nerve stimulation to an area is changing adipose tissue that's my whole problem with this case all right so you're asking for a phys mm -hmm. okay you're asking for a physiological explanation and I appreciate that. I, I, I'm not going to proclaim as a, I'm a physiological expert, 
And, and, I, I, yeah. and, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I bet most of the board members couldn't explain how basic electric stim worked or Russian stim or any of the things that we already use. Oh. So, so I think, you know, I understand well, I, where you're coming again, from. I could but appreciate the effects of the electrical stim and how it's driving the central nervous system. Um, but my question is, how is applying electrical stim to that area going to decrease a person's BMI? Well, I, I, mm. I was, I think that is a, uh, a, I apologize. I think my, my computer may be having a problem. Mm. Can you guys give me a second? Cause I may lose you. I thought this thing was charged up and it's not. Give me two mm. seconds. No problem. Sorry. I may have to get another computer. Hold on one second. Mm. I will just pause the record. This is the reporter. Yep, I agree. Okay, I'm I'm here. I'm just gonna be booting up another computer while uh, <laughs> while we uh, talk here. So no, we're off the record right now, Dr. Siegel. But we're oh. waiting for you to put up your computer. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I got to open this thing up. Uh. All right. Let that thing boot up, and then. Uh, if I lose you guys, I will rejoin you as quick as I humanly can. So,
Did we lose Dr. Siegel? I think we did, yes. We'll just have to wait for him to uh, hook back up. Jeff, do we have a uh, phone number? Maybe you could call us and. I think he's in the lobby. Oh, there he is. Hello. Hello. Back Hello. on the record. Alan, is that you? Dr. Siegel, are you present again? Hello. I can hear you, Dr. Siegel. OK, we can hear you, Dr. Siegel, just can't see you. Well, at least I can't. Oh, you muted yourself. Hello? OK. OK, and do we still have Sean on the call as well, Jeff? Yes, he is. OK, great. No Dr. Dr. Siegel, are you there? No, he's coming back in. OK, hold on. Hmm. Hello. We can hear you. Hello, Dr. Siegel. I don't think he can hear us. Hmm. Boy, I do miss the days I'll of in-person meetings. Dr. Siegel, are you there? Attorney Lenhart, you're muted if you were trying to say something. I'm not getting a response from Dr. Siegel. Can you? I don't think. Hello? Yeah, we can hear him, but I don't think he has uh, audio on his end. Let me send I, him an email. I can see him on the list of meeting participants. He's there. Um, yeah. So he's on, but I think maybe he can't hear us or we cannot hear him. Dr. Siegel, if you are on the call, please try unmuting yourself. No. says in the chat it says uh, hello I called in if you can admit me I'm I'm responding to him just signed off again.
Hello? Hello? Can, can you hear us? Can you, yeah. uh, yes. Dr. Siegel? Can, hear you. can you see me? Okay. No, we can't. All right. I apologize profusely. I don't know what is going on here, but I have one computer that doesn't work and one camera that doesn't seem to want to work either. But you can hear me, so that's good. <laughs> can you see the us on the screen? I can see you on the screen. I just can't get my camera to work, and I don't know why, but so I apologize for that. But at least I could hear everything. Okay, go ahead. I'm terribly sorry about that. Um, that seemed like it was like three days. It was probably about 10 minutes, so. <laughs> okay, so where were we? I, I think we were discussing the physiological effects. I just want to make sure we're back on the record. Yeah. With the court reporter? We are indeed back on the record. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Siegel, my last question was, um, I think when we left it off is that we could all, I think I could appreciate the uh, electrical stimulation and how it drives the nervous system and how it drives um, not only at the segmental level or the muscle or receptor itself, but the peripheral nerve, the cord and the cortex. But I'm having a hard time understanding how electrical stimulation is going to affect the BMI. Okay, so mm -hmm. that, understood. That's uh, it's not a direct correlation. I would say it's more of an indirect correlation. I I think what what I'm trying to say is if you increase, if we affect a motor neuron of a muscle that causes a contraction of a muscle re repeat repeatedly. OK, over a period of time, science has proven that the muscle will get stronger and leaner. OK, and we know people. Well, will... uh, can I can I interrupt for a second? Yes, I, think I have a problem when you sit there and say the muscle will get leaner. The muscle will be activated and we brought the threshold. But what do you mean by leaner? How does a muscle get leaner? There is no fat within the muscle. Let me rephrase stronger. All right. So, and with people with, with stronger muscles typically will have reduced, and the, the slides that I showed you before showed mm -hmm. there was an indirect correlation or a direct correlation with reduction in, in adipose tissue, fat tissue around lean muscle mass, which does ultimately, BMI is not really a great, I'd say percent of body fat would be a better indicator, which is a more accurate indicator of BMI is a formulation that isn't necessarily even a great formulation. It, it percent of body fat would be a better indication of of and it's widely used in mm. in assessing health for patients uh, from a clinical perspective of people that have other issues like you mentioned before, diabetes, hypertension, other cardiovascular disease, lowering a percent body fat tends to help with other conditions which help to um, offset the uh, neurological system. Okay, but I'm still haven't wrapped my head around how the fact that I can understand activating the muscles and it's going to change the central integrated state of the motor neuro, uh, motor neuron and how it's going to have uh, both ascending and descending effects. I have no problem with that, but I still don't understand how by doing that you're going to change uh, the adipose tissue. Mm. Like I said, it's a it's a indirect correlation. If you go back to the previous study, I think it was the second slide. It shows you like the the paragraph there. If we go back to, I think it was back to exhibit or still on exhibit B here. Dr. Siegel, um, just to interject and uh, just to help follow up with uh, Andy, um, could you provide us with a biochemical pathway on how this adipose tissue is reduced, plain and simple, by use of this particular methodology. That's it, just a biochemical pathway on how adipose tissue is reduced using this particular method methodology. That would suffice as a sufficient answer to Dr. Candy's question, I, I assume. Mm -hmm. Dr. Candy, is that correct? Uh, that would be helpful. I don't know if you need to get into the biochemical aspect, but uh, certainly just from a neurophysiological aspect, how is by does electrical stimulation affect the adipose tissue and how? Okay, so 
All right, we're talking about we're talking about two different things here. So we're only really on the electrical stimulation part about this device. There's a second frequency that we haven't gotten to yet. OK, so the radio frequency part, which is more of the diathermic effect, which is the heat effect that I was discussing before, that is the specific modality of the device that will affect that adipose tissue and that that fat cell, if that's what you're talking about, that fat cell. If you look at um, basically uh, the uh, FDA BTL 899FP, I think it was category or uh, exhibit K is in height. Could you pull it up, um, Jeff? Mm. Is it M? Is it K211107? Is that what you're referencing, Dr. Siegel? K21107. It's the yeah, it's the BTL letter, the FDA to the FDA, um, or from the FDA to the manufacturer. I think you're referencing exhibit L then. Yes. Yeah, so if we go to page exhibit L. Yes. 510K summary. How many pages is this right here? Two pages, Dr. Siegel. I'm actually looking for the 510K summary, which was maybe the one after this. Yeah, right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Page, yeah. Page, page two here. Uh, yeah, right there. Indications of use. And this is as per the FDA. Non-invasive lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fat of the abdomen, um, reduction in circ circum circum of, of the abdomen. So basically, this is what the device was clinically. designed for and cl clinically proven to do. I know you asked me for the specific bio, you know, mechanical pathophysio. I'm, uh, like I said, I'm not a physiologist. I don't know all of the, you know, just like I don't know how an aspirin works in the body like everyone else doesn't, but um, there, but this is what the indications of use are and this is what it's been clinically indicated to do. So, um, and that's through the radio frequency, which is the heat part of this device. So, like I said, there's two components: is the electromagnetic, magnetic, as we discuss, like in electrical stimulation, and then there's the radio frequency, which is the heat, and the heat is what does the lipolysis component of what you're asking. So, I, I think maybe before I was explaining it incorrectly so there's confusion but there's two components to this device there's the electromagnetic and then there's the radio frequency and the radio frequency is what does the lipolysis and are they both applied simultaneously or individually uh, it, it's it's applied simultaneously through the through the uh m sculpt neo and if you go down a little bit further in here, mm -hmm. if you go down to uh, the next page of this device here, uh, or just keep scrolling down on this. Uh, let me see if I can just pull up the right page for us so you go, you go right to it. Um, page four, you go to page four, clinical testing right here. Um, I want to be able to indicate that uh, they test this on all different skin types just to make sure that there's no side effect from the, you know, we know that the magnetic and the electromagnetic stimulation uh, would cause the contractual part of the muscle and that this part would cause the heating of the, of the adipose tissue. Mm -hmm. And then it says here, 
uh, uh, in the middle section, primary endpoint subjects with the uh, Fitzpatrick skin types underwent active treatments. All subjects exhibited a reduction in the fat thickness in their abdominal area, matching the efficacy previously evidenced by, this is the predicated device, Circum circumferences reduction was seen at 75% subjects of total. So, and there were no adverse events reported in the course of the clinical investigations or in particular subjects with this. So, in conclusion, it is safe for patients with Fitzpatrick skin types one through six. So, so I think, again, to answer your question, mm. hopefully the the radio frequency component, which is a low level radio frequency, not a high level radio frequency, which would be uh, something that would cut the skin. This is not of that nature. This is a low, uh, more similar to a diathermy type of machine of the heat. And that's what affects the, uh, the actual fat cell. So you have two components. You have increased lean muscle mass, decrease of fat cells, which ultimately would surely affect uh, percent body fat and and help people um, with chronic, you know, low back pain and other chronic health issues. I have a question. Carlos Bogosian here, Dr. Dr. Seal, are you aware of any chiropractic colleges that are accredited by CCE? that are teaching any courses or uh, have this device in the college that the, the, the students are being taught how to use it? Uh, not that I'm specifically aware of, um, but I would also say that there's a lot of low level laser devices in the, in the chiropractic field that are not taught at schools. Um, so, I wish they were, but um, I wouldn't say that every device that's being used in chiropractic practice has been taught or utilized, just like not every adjustment technique and not every nutrition technique and not every, you know, any other thing that you could apply in clinical practice is necessarily taught at a chiropractic college. And now what, how does one become efficient in uh, learning how to apply this you know, this type of care to patients? How do you attain your expertise? How does one get that? Typically, um, manufacturers that you know, manufacture these devices, they have training and implementation programs for professionals. So um, in this case, they do. Um, surely I would want to make sure that, you know, I or any other practitioner was well versed and well educated in the application of this device. I would say um, that to the best of my knowledge that this device in in other states does not uh, require even a chiropractic license or another clinical license that this device has been proven safe and effective to the point where non-licensed health professionals are able to utilize this device. Um, so I, I believe that it's a very safe device that would require, you know, minimal to moderate training for it to be applied effectively and safely to all patients. I think like any other <laughs> device, um, you know, you want to rule out, you know, infection, you want to surely pregnancy, uh, you know, uh, underlying cancers, you know, anything that would be uh, uh, open wounds, you know, anything that would be uh, contraindicative indicative and, and would just be logical and sensible of, of a doctor with any experience. So I, I think uh, I think that the device has been proven safe, very safe, very effective with almost zero to no side effects, zero to no um, uh, complaints uh, or uh, problems. Uh, did anybody else have any questions? Or right. Dr. CEO, did you want to continue? Uh, yes, if I could. Um, uh, 
I have a, I have a question, Dr. Robotham. Am I there? Can you hear me? Hello? We can yes. hear you. Um, question, uh, Dr. Siegel. Um, I know um, most malpra chiropractic malpractice insurances cover modalities. Would this particular uh, item or this particular device be covered by malpractice insurance? Uh, well, I would say 100%. So most malpractice uh, uh, would cover this. I, I, I don't think that most malpractices don't specifically name devices. They'll name, you know, if you can use certain types of modalities, I think this would fall under a mo modality device for sure. Um, and I don't think there would be any other problems, especially due to the, the when I say it's not minimally invasive, I'm using the word non-invasive non-invasive modality. There is no uh, invasivity of this device whatsoever on the human body. Uh, it is providing a external effect to create a physiological effect internally on the on the system, similar to other modalities used in the chiropractic field. So the answer to that question, if it was a yes or no question is I, I would say I would say yes that if 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 a suit were to be claimed for a chiropractic device, that the chiropractor would be covered, yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Siegel, did you have anything else on the material that you presented that you wanted to review? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, We can just go to, um, I think the same document that was just up, the, uh, the, the US page five, if we can go to page five. Uh, go right, indications of use uh, here would be, again, we spoke about the lipolysis, which is the breakdown of the, of the fat in the abdomen, mm -hmm. the reduction of circ circum circumference of the abdomen, uh, the non-invasive lipolysis breakdown of fat of the thighs. And then if you go down to the, the basic technology of the device, it says it's bipolar radio frequency with electromagnetic stimulation. So again, those are the two basic premises of the device. And I think if you were to separate these two technologies, you would find them already being used in chiropractic offices um, throughout the state of Connecticut. Uh, this device happens to combine the two of them, so you can get two various effects, which is one, increased muscle strength and core strengthening, as well as a secondary effect of lipolysis breakdown of fat tissue. And my argument, you know, for the use of this device is the safety and effect efficacy of the device the non-invasive nature of the device, the fact that these modalities are already being used in, in common practice in chiropractic offices, and clinically, as mm -hmm. uh, the doctor had mentioned earlier, that if we're allowed to assess patients through diet and nutrition and exercise for the purposes of improving neurological function, by potentially not treating their diabetes or not treating their hypertension, but by treating their body uh, and their other disease processes improve, then therefore that improves their neurological systems as well. So um, I would I would argue to use this clinically in a practice for the purposes of the betterment of the patient. Um, uh, from a total, you know, healthcare perspective. So, all right. Did anybody else have any other questions for Dr. Siegel? Yeah, I do. I again, this might be just asking the same question again. Uh, I just did not hear the clear response on this. Is that if this device? I understand that. Um, Dr. Siegel is saying this would work in a chiropractic setting for strengthening the muscles and reducing the uh, fat content uh, to strengthen the core muscles. But my 
my question is again, if this device is specifically being used as a laser for fat loss, if that's something that's happening, uh, not in a chiropractic setting, but if someone else is doing this for that reason, if you know of that. Uh, I, I, I would say the answer to that would probably be yes. If you're asking if someone else is using this, but I can't speak for somebody else. I can only speak for my profession and for what I wish to do as a clinical provider for my patients and how I see this as a positive device and clinical outcome for my patient. So, uh, and again, if we are going to discuss, you know, fat loss, okay, if we want to really discuss fat and obesity and the effects of it on our society and on our patient's health, I would argue that whether it was a chiropractor, a nutritionist, uh, a lay person, if they're legally allowed to do so, in helping someone to get physically fit, lose weight, percent body fat, are you doing them uh, more harm than good? I would say the answer is you're doing them more good than harm. So that would be my argument. Yes, I understand, Dr. Siegel. However, if the device is being used for aesthetic purposes, not necessarily the effects of fat loss, but fat loss in the sense of improving aesthetically, that's uh, th that becomes a different uh, way of using it. But I'm not ask I'm not asking for it to be used in that setting. I'm asking this. This is I presented clinical evidence with physiological effects of a device that are make a positive impact on a patient in a clinical setting. So I am asking for a clinical evaluation of the device to review the physiological evidence of what the device on the on the documents that I've I've presented. And if anyone can counter argue that 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 they don't do what they say they can do <laughs> physiologically, then I would say, you know, I, I can't speak for, you know, if someone has their, you know, one device on this end of the block and one device on this end of the block. And if a chiropractor is using the same laser for pain that someone's using for hair loss removal, I can't really I can't really say, well, you can't use that device for hair laser removal because I'm using it for for pain. You know, it's 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 not a you know, it's an argument that I'm 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 trying to say that I want to use this in a clinical setting for patients that would benefit physiologically by core strengthening of their muscles and reduced percent body fat. So you could argue aesthetically that people may look better and that may be true. And that's not a bad thing, but you know what I'm saying is, are they physiologically healthier? And the answer is yes. I, I just have a few questions. If the board was all set before turning it over to Attorney Lenhart, uh, Doctor Obama, I have a question. One for last question for Doctor Siegel. You can ask as many as you want, John. Okay, thanks. Um, so, Doctor Siegel. Would you, if had, having the opportunity to use this device in your practice, would this device be used secondary to you invoking a detailed exercise and dietary regimen for that patient that has that high BMI? I would, I would do it consecutively. I mean, this is the way I would apply it. I would apply appropriate diet, appropriate nutrition, appropriate exercise program. Um, if, if if I could, uh, and I, I, I truly apologize because I'm, I'm, the exhibits are, I didn't write them down quick enough, but um, if I can go to the slideshow, uh, this is appropriate to the question now. Um, it's the but, but again, again, I, again, let's just say that the device does what it does. But again, would it be used secondary, all right, a after you've given your patient the appropriate dietary behavior modifications they need to make. You've instructed them on the diet. You've sat down with them with proper supplementation and exercise instruction. And if that fails, then go to this device. But if it doesn't fail, then why would you need the device? Well, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you if I, if I could. I'm going to answer the question. I would say I would use it consecutively. I would do it together because the results are that much more. Uh, it's faster. It's quicker. Okay. And we also know that 
patient population compliance for diet and exercise is very low. You know, and and if we could pull up uh, the, um, uh, I think it's going to be, I'm not going to guess here. Can we pull up exhibit D as in David, I think? Just to answer this question a little bit more thoroughly. Um, I got to find the page. Here. I wrote down my notes here. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, if we go to page 58, I think it's page 58. Is this the right document? Uh, What's on the screen is exhibit D. Oh, uh, uh, no. So what it's, was that, on the screen was exhibit D. That, that's D as in David? Not that one. What was there before? Oh, uh, go to, I think it's. Are you looking for B, the emulsoscope, H-I-F-E-M presentation slides? Yes, please. I think so. That's 29 Qu pages. Question. Pa page 58. There's a page 58 in one of those slides. Is that the? Total of 29 pages, Dr. Siegel. It's the it's the next the next one with the um there's another slide presentation, page 58. There are no page numbers, Dr. Siegel. Oh. The total uh, number of pages for exhibit B was 29 pages. How about how about C like Charlie? Exhibit C? C is a two-page document to the FDA from the FDA. Dated July 5th, 2019 to yeah. BTF Industries. There's no document that was entered. That's a total of 58 pages or more. Is there another? I thought there was another another. Um, exhibit B is your longest exhibit. What? Right, can we pull that one up? Let me just see if it's in there. Then I thought there was I thought there was another. Mm -hmm. Another slideshow specifically, but maybe not. No, it's one not last quick question. Hey, Dr. Steele, can I interject one moment again, Dr. Yeah. Rotham? Would you agree that behavioral, patient behavioral modification in regards to exercise and diet is longer lasting than the effects of this de device? Yes or no? Uh, are you asking me a question? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I think it depends on the patient. I think, I mean, you know, if 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 everyone was so compliant, we wouldn't have uh, chronic health problems that we have in our in our society. So, I think it's a patient by patient situation. I think you always want to uh, in, emphasize modification, lifestyle changes, dietary changes, exercise changes. That's a that's a given with every patient, you know. But you know, when the patient keeps coming back and they're five pounds heavier, or they're they're their back still bothering them, and they they're they're not making the changes that you've asked them to do. Um, I just feel like if you can, you know, uh, give them uh, an extra modality that could help increase the positive physiological effects that you're looking for for your patient. Just like if someone came in in chronic pain and you put interferential on them. You know, you're trying to get them out of pain quicker. You could say, "Go home and put some ice on it," and that would work too. But, um, you know, if you interferential plus the ice makes it quicker, you know, why would you go for a faster uh, result physiologically for your patient? If they're, if they're a, 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 an MI potential, you know, person or a, a diabetic person who needs to, you know improve their H1AC quickly because they're starting to get neuropathies, why would you not expedite the healing process physiologically for that patient if you could help them improve their health quickly? So unfortunately, Again, I, I, I thought I, I think there is another, I thought there, there's no other Power, PowerPoint presentation. I, I'm pretty sure I submitted that to, to, to uh, no? No. OK, all right. Anyway, it basically I mean, I, I could sum it. I know it's irrelevant, but it basically showed how uh, this device. Dr. Siegel, we're, Dr. Siegel, we're only going to talk about evidence that's in the record. So did okay. you. Is, and um, Sean, did he answer your question? It sounded like you wanted to circle back to something. Yeah, because he was telling me about expediting um, results. And my question was, does the results from actually uh, active patient behavioral modifications 
in regards to diet and exercise last longer than the effects of this particular modality. That's it. You know, and I, I, I pose that question as a practitioner that emphasizes diet and nutrition and gets down on the floor and meets patients in gyms and totally changes their concept and their body perception. And with that, they come back years later with the same results of the reduction without me having to apply any kind of modality. Mm -hmm. And that too has in regards to pain modification and pain um, management naturally through supplementation, exercise, and diet. So again, but those behavior modifications outlast the results of this applied modality? That's the question, doctor. Thank you. It's a yes or no question to you, Dr. Siegel. I would say if you're asking if long-term behavior modifications are effective over long-term, yes, absolutely. But that would be, that's just kind of- That's not his question, Dr. Siegel. Yeah. What's the Do question? You ask it again, Sean. <laughs> Again, with the effects, effects of behavior modification in regard to diet, dietary changes, and exercise, they would, would they outlast the effects of the use of this modality? It, yes it, no. if, I mean, yes, but it's really not a yes or no question because it's subjective if the patient's following those, following those guidelines. So yes, Thank if the you, patient sir. does what you tell them to do, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Dr. Siegel, um, just to go into a different direction here a little bit, could you give me some protocols that have been established um, in regarding these treatments? Yes. Um, if we go, we go back to the original slideshow, um, most of the treatments show these positive physiological effects within two to four treatments uh, of a application to the patient um, and due to their non-invasive and low risk effects. Uh, if you scroll down to some of the studies, it'll show you. Um, so basically a protocol would be anywhere from four to eight treatments showing a certain amount of um, effects here. So uh, we stop right here, I think. Uh, four sessions, you could see these are just some samples, but just to answer your question right here, 22 patients were treated in four sessions within two weeks and showing some of the positive outcomes. So it, it's not a forever treatment. It's uh, it can be again. My point being is you can see results very, very quickly. And to 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 the point of the, the prior doctors, you know, question is that if you combine this with diet exercise, you know, hydration, the results would be through the roof. I mean, you, you would have such a positive physiological effect on your patients, you know, it, it would it would be so beneficial for them. And, and, you know, if you have patients that are, you know, significantly obese with significant risk factors and you can make a positive impact quicker, why why wouldn't you do so you know so and how long does each treatment last the treatments are 30 minutes it says right there okay so doc, dr candy were you when he's saying a protocol um i understand this is a a sample in here what's on the screen uh Protocol meaning that there's specific diag based on a specific diagnosis and application it is to, you know, improve the function based on a diagnosis of what the protocol will be, or generally what you apply to anyone who has some sort of obesity factor. I guess, uh, you know, we, uh, I'm just trying to understand, that. was that your question, like a protocol for just anybody that's obese, or is there a protocol that's specific with a specific condition that would apply this in a specific number of treatments to expect an outcome that's measurable, mm. improves function. I mean, are we, is that, was that your question? I'm not sure. Oh, I was looking more specifically for the number of visits and the um, time frame for the treatments. But um, I guess my, ex the expectations, um, how they're explained to the patient would be an interesting scenario. Somebody comes in and says, listen, I'm getting married in a month. 
you're going to reduce my fat thickness by 18.6% in a month? I mean, is that what you would tell a patient? That's not what I'd be treating them for, no. Okay. I would, I would expect them to have more clinical issues that would be found in a chiropractic office. Mm. And would an examination prior to the onset of treatment be, I imagine, would be um, stipulated? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. I mean, a person comes in before you apply this therapy, you would do a complete physical examination on that patient? Of, of course, yes. Just like you would before you applied any modality, you would go through their medical and social history, make sure there's no contraindications, check for, um, you know, all, you know, his, medical history, you know, whatever their primary complaint is, if they have three or four other medical conditions, and if the application of the modality is a, is is clinically warranted, and the the application is to again have a positive physiological effect for the patient to improve ultimately their nervous system, as mm -hmm. we spoke about, uh, then that would be the application of the device. Right, does anybody else have any other questions? Otherwise, we'll turn it over to uh, Mary Alice. Mary Alice, did you have any questions? You, I may have some follow-up questions after um, attorney um, Moore Lenhart goes, but I'll let her go first. Okay. On behalf of the Thank board. You. Thank you. Mm. Uh, good morning, Dr. Siegel. Hi, good morning. Hello, I just have a few questions because the board has, um, as usual, delved into this and drilled down into the core issues to the licensure piece. So um, your background and education did not include training at a chiropractic college for using this particular device. Is that right? Uh, well, well, I graduated 20 years ago. This device and technology wasn't around probably, <laughs> at least not as it is today. So, but right. surely on electric, uh, electrical stimulation and so the answer is no for this device, if that's Thank what the, you. Yeah. I, I believe your testimony was that there is no training at chiropractic colleges for the use of a device like this at the current time. Do you recall that testimony? I, I do, but if you break down the technology, that would say the answer is we are trained for diathermy, we are trained for infrared, we are trained for electrical stimulation and for electromagnetic stimulation. I understand. I think the scope of this hearing is just for this particular device, and I'm not trying to be argumentative with you. I just wanted to follow up on Dr. Bogosian's question to you to understand that as far as your background and training goes, you were not trained at chiropractic college, and understandable technology evolves over the years. Um, and there is no training that you know of at, currently at these colleges. That's your testimony, right? On this particular device, no. Right. Okay. So um, other than um, the manufacturer training course for the use of this device for use by chiropractors under these clinically indicated circumstances that you've described in your uh, testimony, which has been very informative, I might add. Are you aware of any specific continuing education courses that have been offered for chiropractors who seek to use these devices? I would say there are courses that review similar devices, not specifically this device, but other types of low level, low level laser therapies that have similar clinical outcomes. All right. And um, applications. Thank you, but not not with regard to this particular device, right? No, there's no no one continuing educated course that I know of that is specific to this device. No. All right. um, and, and you have 
as of today, have you actually been trained for the use of this particular device in a chiropractic setting? I, I have not been trained. I have only uh, observed demonstration and have observed patients being treated um, as I, you know, I haven't moved forward with anything further until I hear uh, what the ruling is on the ability to utilize this device in my practice. And then once I, we get that ruling, then I will surely be trained. Okay. Uh, thank you. In those situations where you've actually observed other practitioners using this device, what were the licenses that those practitioners held? What was the licenses? Yes. It, it was it was a demonstration by the manufacturer. It wasn't being used. It was a, a it was so it wasn't in a well, maybe I misspoke or it wasn't necessarily by a licensed. I know it's not being used by um uh I know other states that don't require any licensure, to be honest with you, for the use of the device, but we're not dealing with other states, so um, well, let me let me follow up on that. OK, uh, first of all. You did not observe a licensed professional utilize the equipment in connection with providing services to a uh, regarding the use of the equipment. Is that right? When you right. Saw this it, was, it was a it was a it was a demonstration with the manufacturer and the person that was there was um, I believe an unlicensed person that was demonstrating right. the device. Okay, now you said that there are other because states. Because state, the state of New York didn't require a license, so that's why we're able to do it. Okay, may I ask you a question then? Following yes. up on that. Um, you did previously at the prior hearing, I believe, inform this board that the state of New York does not require chiropractors to uh, uh, have this ha have permission from the licensing board in order to use this device in their practice is that right that is my understanding yes and what do you base that understanding on uh based on conversations that i've had with both the device manufacturer and from um uh information i've tried to obtain from the um uh, uh, department of licensing for new york state all right, so did you submit a request for ruling from the Department uh, of Licensing in the state of New York? I, I did not. The use of this device? I started with. You did that. not. I did not. Uh, so, so you're licensed in New York, correct? Correct. As a chiropractor? Correct. How long have you practiced in New York State as a licensed chiropractor? Um, 1996. 6 22 years all right and what percentage of the patients in your practice in new york um are using are, are you using this device on i am not using the device in new york state wait didn't you just testify that new york state no, doesn't require I, a license I, I didn't say i was using it i said that my understanding is that they don't require that uh, my understanding is that a chiropractor can use this device in new york state that that is my understanding that's what i'm testifying to all right so is there a reason why you haven't used this device in new york state with regard to your patients with the intended purposes that you've uh, identified to this board today there is no specific reason other than i wanted to find out if I can use it in Connecticut because my plans were to move to Connecticut and to be able to bring this device or purchase the device for use of practice in the state of Connecticut. Um, fair enough. So in other words, you're not making this line of services available to the patients in New York um that you're currently treating and seeing who you believe could benefit from a device such as this as you represented to the board was your belief if connecticut permits you to do so i haven't ruled out getting that device for new york it's a very expensive device so part of my you know uh 
wanting to make sure that I go through these procedural hearings is that I surely don't waste a lot of of my personal assets on a device that I will not be able to utilize in practice. So like I said, I started with the state of Connecticut uh, before I do the same in the state of New York. My plan would be to make sure that I get the same judiciary final hearing allowing me to use the device in a legal capacity before signing the dotted line on a on a you know a, an expensive you know purchase for medical equipment. Well, that I guess the, I, question? No, I, I, I don't think it answers the question. Okay. Do you yes. want to ask it again? Yeah. Would you please answer my question? Why yes. aren't you using it in New York if New York would permit you to do so without having to get a ruling from the board since you said it's already allowed in New York? I haven't decided to purchase it as of today's date. That's my answer. It's it's a couple hundred thousand dollars this device, so I have not decided to purchase it yet. I'm still I'm, I'm still going practicing? through my diligence. What is it about your diligence that you need to complete in order to use this device in the state of New York since you have been practicing there for 22 years and you have such a strong belief in the um, uh, in the uh, efficacy of this device to help your patients? Uh, it's like another mortgage payment that I'm trying to decide if it's makes sense, knowing that insurance won't pay for it, and if it's if I can clinically apply it to a, to a, a non deficit in my own personal practice and professional practice, then then I would do so. If I can if I can come up with a um, a clinical plan for a patient that they might be willing to pay for such a device that would help expedite their healing process. We know insurance, you know, only pays for a certain amount of services and certain amount of codes, and this code surely would not be a billable service. So as of right now, I'm still doing my due diligence from a implementation perspective of such an expensive device in my practice. All right, so j just it's to circle that. I don't believe in the clinical efficacy of it, I do. I wanna make sure that I'm doing things appropriately and and like i said i i started with the state of connecticut and so i'm doing my my due diligence here well i just want to go back to that because i'm still trying to wrap my mind around your answer you have a practice in new york for 22 years you've testified that new york does not require a chiropractor to be specifically licensed to use this device in new york and yet you're not using it in new york right, right. and just and to clarify I've stated to the best of my knowledge, I've been I've been told and my understanding, I have not gone through the judicial process in New York like I'm going through the state of Connecticut. I'm licensed in the state of Connecticut, so I have the the due right to do what we're doing here today to try and get a a response to make sure I'm practicing within the scope of practice. And that's what I'm doing. No, no one disputes that, sir, and or doctor. I don't mean to have you feel defensive about what you can or can't do under your license in Connecticut. How many patients do you see in Connecticut at the current time on a roughly monthly basis? Zero. And and so zero percent of your practice currently is based in the state of Connecticut. Is that right? Correct. All right. Like and said, other than New York, what other states do not require chiropractors to have a license to use this device? You've testified several times that other states do not require chiropractors to have a license to use the device. To what the, other states? To the best of my knowledge, I, I don't know the other states at this time. Well, do you think it's fair for you to represent to this board where you have a duty of candor and you took an oath, a statement that is, quote, other states do not require chiropractors to have licenses to use this device. Given the answer to my prior question that you just rendered. I'm trying to be as truthful and honest as I can. I'm giving you the information that I know of. Um, I, I don't want to misspeak, but I can, I could, you know, I had asked for uh, a uh, manufacturer representative to come on this meeting 
and I believe you had objected to that. So some of these questions I don't want to answer without the truthful knowledge of it. Um, well, well, then would you like to withdraw your testimony under oath that you made to this board, Dr. Siegel, that you no. said other states do not require chiropractors to have licenses to use this device? Would you like to take advantage of an opportunity to withdraw that misstatement? to the board since it's not based on any factual knowledge that you have in your current possession? Well, with the exception of New York, you can take that out, yes. Well, didn't you just tell me that you weren't sure about New York and that you were going to have to seek a decision from the judiciary there in order to use the device in New York? Well, I would do that no matter what, because most scopes of practices are somewhat ambiguous and I would rather find out the information before versus after, so. All right, I'm just gonna to jump to the protocols. Um, have you developed any particular uh, indications for use of this device on the patients that you serve in your current practice in New York? Well, considering that I'm not using the device, the answer would be no. All right, so uh, second, Secondly, have you developed an informed consent form that you would utilize uh, with your patients in Connecticut if the board were to approve uh, the use of this device in Connecticut? The answer would be yes, if approved, I surely would consult with counsel and, and design an appropriate informed consent form for this device. All right, but you haven't done so to date? No, because I don't have the device, so I wouldn't, right. have, I wouldn't have a need to. Uh Based on the device research that you've done, uh, what would the risks be that you would share with the patient in the event that uh, you were using the, the seeking informed consent for use with a particular patient? Are you surely, aware? Yes. Um, surely, uh, informed consent would be any contraindications of use, which would be based on surely manufactured and you know guidelines which is how these things are you know infection pregnancy uh any cancer metastasis anything that you would not want to uh increase any kind of metabolic activity in the area um surely would be counter indic indicative of this treatment so those would be described, and that would be part of the medical history uh, to find out if any of those things were applicable to this patient. All right, that isn't that though part of your decision making as a doctor to determine whether or not to offer the use of the device to the patient as opposed to seeking their informed consent. Um, I'm sorry, you asked the question again. I, I'm, All right, I, you, I asked you. What are the known risks of the use of this device on a patient uh, that you would include, for example, in an informed consent discussion? Oh, known risks, potential, yes. potential skin irritation, potential muscle mm -hmm. soreness, potential, um, you know, uh, like we said, I mean, there, there's so little side effects that, you know, I, I, I don't even know what else to put in there. You know, surely, you know, um, you know, the, the, the studies haven't shown to show too many side effects. So, so that's, that, that's the only ones I've seen are skin, skin irritation and muscle soreness. Um, what reason, since you have not um, yourself used the device, what research have you done to securely identify the risks of uh, injury or adverse effects to a patient in the event of using the device? What research Other than I manufacturing brochure. Well, I, I only have what I have and the only information in the public marketplace is what everyone on this board and on this meeting has access to. It's all the same information that I have. Uh, everything that's been submitted to the FDA. So uh, I've read as much of that literature as I can to understand the device and the effects on the human body. And 
in my professional opinion, it's it's uh, non-invasive yet physiologically effective, and that's the way I, I you know I've interpreted the data that I've read so far, and I've pretty much read everything I've submitted to the to the to the board here today. All right. And then I just have one last uh, area of questions, and then I will stop. Um, you talked about making a determination of the device being clinically warranted. Um, from your point of view as a chiropractor, what are the critical underpinnings of a determination that using this particular device as opposed to another device or a um, uh, some other method, therapeutic method, would be warranted. I think this device in particular has shown to effectively and efficiently help patients increase core muscle strength, reduce percent body fat by lipolysis, which in turn reduces, you know, clinically people with low back pain, with arthritis in their joints. If you want to go a step further into your diabetic and hypertensive patients and all of the ill effects that come with those disease processes. And I think combined with proper diet, nutrition, and exercise protocols, I think the effects could be pronounced and dramatic for the patient. Uh, in achieving better health, and I believe, and I truly believe that. Okay, well, th certainly that's the goal. I, and I'm going to leave it to the experts on the board to do follow-up questions. I'm not sure you answered my question, but I, I uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Alice. Um, does anybody else have any other questions for uh, Dr. Siegel? My my question, this is Gina, is um, areas of use, the research that or the documents that you've provided have demonstrated essentially it's in the uh, core region, I would say, from the uh, ribs to the buttock region. Is there any other area of application or is it specific for this, these regions? At this time, the application process is for the abdomen and for the uh, uh, the the uh, pelvic and gluteal region, and I, I believe it, and I believe uh, it can, and can be applied to the the thigh as well. If you're below the, uh... thank you. Anybody else have any other questions? I have a few questions, um, Candy. Please. Okay. Um, Dr. Siegel, are you aware of any state that has approved the use of this device in the practice of chiropractic? Actually approved it specifically yeah. for chiropractic. Yeah. I don't know that a state has to approve it if the scope of practice already allows it. So, so you I so I don't know. If, I I can't speak for fifty states. You know, you're asking me for speak for fifty states, and well, I can't do that. So I'm, no. My question is: Are you aware of any state that has actually approved the use of this device in chiropractic care? The answer I would say is: If if I'm aware of it, no. But my answer also would be: Is that I don't know. It has to be approved. I I understand you're trying okay. to do it, that carve out. I'm just asking you. Or, what I hear you saying is you're not aware of any state that has approved this device. Not, so. not approved it, but again, I don't know that they have to approve it. I, I get that. Okay. okay. Um, so exhibit B, at the bottom of it, it says H-I-F-E-M, and then throughout that name appears. What is H-I-F-E-M mean? Um, that is just the electromagnetic frequency. That's just their acronym for it. Um, if you go back to the very first page of the very first uh, um, exhibit, I well, not the first exhibit, but the one with the slideshow, it, it pretty much goes into what that HIFM is. Okay, so who produced the slideshow that you're relying on for exhibit B? 
the manufacturer. Okay, so this is the manufacturer's slideshow. And do you know who the slideshow was presented to? Uh, I don't know who it was presented to. I know it was, you know, I, I had requested it um, and, they had, and they had given it to me. I assume that they use this in their presentations for, for their whatever, their trade shows, their, their marketing shows, their sales shows, you know, to doctors that are interested in the device. Okay. And the manufacturer is who? Uh, BTL Industries Incorporated. Okay, great. So then I just wanted to ask you, just so we understand what we are looking at. Mm -hmm. I think it was exhibit K you were talking about. Yes. So, um, um, Jeff, can you pull up exhibit K for a minute? Yeah, just uh, tell me what the. It's, it's K as in carry. Right. Yeah. What uh, what did it say, though? What, which, which one was it? I wasn't able to mark them on the screen. That's okay. CL Industries 510K Summary. It's dated January 26, 2020. It's one of the last exhibits that came in. Is this the one? Whoops. Hold on. And thank you. Is this the one you're looking for? I, I believe so. So, um, I think it's page five. Jeff, is it possible to scroll to that? Oh, hold, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Oh. I'm sorry, say that again, Carrie. I just wanted page five. Okay. Thank you. And just go up just a little bit right there. So, so Dr. Siegel, at the top of that, the block that we see, the second two, the second and the third column reference two numbers, KTO. 2199K19224. Are those the devices that you're talking about today? Yes. Okay. I mean, one's, the, one's the predicate to the other, but yes. So those are the two devices that are the subject of this ruling? Yes. Okay. And BTL Industries is the manufacturer? Correct. Okay. So where it says indications for use, where does it say that it's used for core muscle strength and development? So the reduction in the circum circum circumference of the abdomen and the reduction in the circumference of the thighs, that is the muscle component of it. The prior device, which is the, that's why I gave you the predicate device, well, no, I'm talking about these two devices right now. No, I know, but so let's. Oh, I just want I want to focus on those two devices. So, where I, does so yeah. so so the it's basically the reduction in circum circumference of the abdomen and the reduction in circumference of the thighs. That's the that's the the muscle strengthening, the muscle toning, the muscle tightening with this device. Yeah, I'm I'm not a doctor, so and I'm not going to play one on TV, but. Doesn't that have to do with fat loss and aesthetics versus strengthening of muscles? Well, you could look at it two different ways, but I would say, you know, it could be both. And, and I also would say is if you look at the FDA, you, know, you have to look at the the, the way in which these uh, FDA, that's why I submitted all of the devices because they basically combine the two technologies and the electromagnetic stimulation is the technology that does the strengthening and that was on the kto um but that's not this device correct no but it, that is the technology that's in this device and you based know, on what do you say that because i i I know it's the predicator and it says right there electromagnetic stimulation is the basic technology right below it. 
and that is the technology in which you apply the muscle strengthening and muscle toning and muscle stimulation. If you pull up exhibit J, Jeff. I think it's the one right before it. It's a one page document. So yeah, that's it. So the de device we're talking about is K2 02119, correct, Dr. Siegel? Correct, yes. Okay, and this is what the indications for use are from the Department of Health and Human Services, correct? Yes. And where it's listed indications for uses, where is it there that says that this is used to reduce, um, to strengthen muscle and core, muscle strength? Well, I would refer back to the reduction in circ circumference of the abdomen and reduction in circumference of the thighs. That is the, that is what is occurring there. You were strengthening. Okay. Again, couldn't that just be for fat loss versus strength? Is it fair to say that it's unclear? Well, sure, we could say it's unclear, but uh, what I'm saying is there, there are predicate mm -hmm. devices. I, I, I'm trying to give a proper analogy here. If you have a car, right, and then the next year they come out with the next model of the car, well, it's pretty much the same car. Now they added one or two things on top of that car right that make the device faster or better or whatever so what i'm saying is that this device is the same device that does the physiological effects of the motor increase and the strength why they chose to take the indications out here specifically i couldn't answer for that but i know that it's the same exact technology is it is and, and you may not know the answer, but is it fair to um, say that the improved muscle tone and firmness for strength muscles in arms was removed because maybe that was no longer an indicated use when it got approved? Um, I would say I don't think that was the intention because that's how they still describe the product and that's how they still um you know but it's it's fair to say that that's no longer present in the newest model that language improvement of muscle tone and fitness for strength muscles in the arms is that correct i i as it's written i would say yeah i would say it's not written as that correct okay, okay um attorney moore lenhart did my questions prompt any questions for you Hi, I just had one question. Um, following your um, line of questioning, counsel, I I don't even think I need to be an expert to state this because I'm a health nut, as some of the members of the board may, may or may not be aware. But I have to say that when I strengthen muscles and I I work on that activity with diet and exercise. The circumference of my thighs expands because the muscles are expanding. So I'm having difficulty understanding your answer to these questions that you say because the muscle is getting strengthened, the circumference of the abdomen or the thighs is going to be reduced as it pertains to muscle. Can you somehow... Uh, explain further to eliminate my confusion here? Uh, I would say that it's a combination of reduction in adipose, lipose in the body with increased fat reduces the, the overall circumference of the abdomen. Is that fair? I just asked you to answer my question. How I feel I, about your your answer I, I, is not really pertinent to this hearing. Okay, well, I, I answered so it. So thank it's you a for the answer, and I have no It's a combination of lipolysis. Dr. Steele, she, Attorney Lenhardt said she had no further questions. Oh. Thank you, no further I, questions. I, I want to make sure I answered it, that's all. You did. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Siegel, I, for, I had one other question for you. The use of this device 
on patients? Is it a long term use? So or is it a series of sessions that produce long term results? I would say it's a series of sessions that can produce long term results. Surely when combined with patient modification and education. So, so after they, they will get physiological results within a short period of time that will be long lasting to to the effect that the patient still, you know, if they go and 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 do things that are contraindicative of proper nutrition and proper health, then surely the the positive effects will will, will surely come back. You know, I mean, the, the negative effects will surely come back. You know, does that answer so, the question? So if they're not continuing on with an exercise or nutrition program, the effects of the use of the device will cease. They would have to go back and have further treatments. I think long term, yeah, I think that's pretty much with every treatment in this society. If they don't do the things they need to do to correct the disease process, then the disease comes back. OK, thank you. I don't know if the board, oh, Attorney Lenhart looks like she might have had one question. <laughs> One other question. I'm sorry. I meant to ask for each session yeah. in which this device is used on a patient, what is the approximate cost? Um, I think it's up to the practitioner to set a price and the market to set a price. I've seen anywhere from 50 to $100 per session. Um, All right, thank you. That's the best of my knowledge. I just I have a follow up question. Yeah, this Go is ahead. Gina. Is that Carlos? Did you have a question, Carlos? Go ahead, Gina. I'll go after you. OK, thank you. Um, this pertains to the licensing again. Um, it, are you aware, uh, Dr. Siegel, of any state that disallows a chiropractor to use the device? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, am I am I aware of any state that disallows? No, I'm not. Thank you. Kyle, Dr. did you have a question? Yeah, this is a question. Dr. Siegel, so you had mentioned in your uh, today that you feel like this device, the technology is very similar to electrical stimulation and ionophoresis, right? Is that what you said? This like combination uh, of more, both of more those? Like a, more diathermy, infrared. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and Russian and more like a Russian stimulation, which stimulates motor points to increase contractual uh, muscle contractions. Uh, I would so compare you, if I if I had to put it into more simplistic technology terms, I would say the, the physiological effects are similar to not exact, but it's similar to like a Russian stimulation and a diathermic effect. And uh, when you and have you used any of those uh, modalities? Throughout your practice, diathermy, infrared, or electrical stim to for patients. Sure. Now, um, there is always, and again, there is obviously there is a process of examination, history, and running your diagnosis, and expecting a measured outcome, improvement of function when you apply those modalities. That would be that would be congruent with your original diagnosis. So my question I'd asked earlier, I'd asked if there are any specific uh, diagnoses that you know that you would, that would this, that this device would be helped to come up with an outcome, measured outcome. And I didn't hear any specific ones. You said application of the, 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 you know, the, ab, the abdominal muscles or the gluteus or low back. But are there any specific diagnoses that this will be used for? To expect a I, I would, I would okay. if you're looking for specific, I would say yes. If someone came in with facet arthrosis and was having significant back pain due to facet arthrosis, that potentially a reduction in in their overall um, uh, body weight core strengthening exercises could help facilitate, reduce the facet arthrosis, then I would apply it to that patient if they could know otherwise, um, you know, do these things on their on their own merit, basically. And 
uh, just like they can't necessarily apply a chiropractic adjustment to themselves in, in most cases. Uh, if someone had lumbar um, arthrosis throughout the lumbar spine, I would do this dis degenerative disc disease, applying excessive pressure through the lumbar spine area that would benefit a patient. There are studies and studies and studies and studies that show reduction of overall body weight is a positive effect on patients suffering with arthritis, not only in the spine, but the hips, the knees, all the way through the lower extremity. Sacral ileitis, if someone had chronic sacral ileum problems or chronic mm. other issues that are being affected by excessive or weakened core muscle strength that would warrant physical therapy and exercise therapy and other ways of helping to increase muscle tone, all of those diagnoses would be positively affected by the use of this device. And I think what's specific to this device is that the efficiency as to which you can see results, um, where we get frustrated as practitioners sometimes where we can't get the results, either A, due to you know, the chronicity of the problem, or B, the patient's lack of compliance for really wanting to do what we're asking them to do. And if we can apply a modality that can help us achieve those results and get that patient feeling better, then that would be the indication for the use of this device. I have some clinical questions there. Back in some of the materials that um, were listed, I believe, and I think it was the PowerPoint, they, the company specifically um, outlined diastasis recti and apoptosis. Those are significant physiological effects. Do you know if they actually study that? In were there for the apoptosis, do they do a tissue sample of that? And for the diastasis recti, did they actually have a patient that was that received the benefit of that? And if that's the case, that in and of itself is a significant, significant clinical use. And a lot of, especially in postpartum women that suffer that condition quite often. Uh, the answer to that is um, I have access to the same research I provided the board, whatever is in there. I don't, I believe it was studied. I believe um, in that diagram that I sent you, I think there was a tissue sample that was um, actually uh, taken from one of the. Um, uh, 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 what's what I'm the trials basically, uh, and they did show clinically under histology that that uh, was yeah that did occur. So yes. Thank thank you, thank you. Hi, Carrie. I've got a, a legal question. Um, the, the part of that PowerPoint that, uh, presentation included six articles that were. Um, they're very difficult to read, and I know that we can't go outside of the material that's presented in doing research, but since they were part of the PowerPoint, can we pull those articles up on our own to review those? Hi, Candy, what part are you not re are you not able to see? No, the, what, the part of the presentation in the PowerPoint included yeah. six, six articles. Those articles were not submitted as part of the um, evidence in the record, so no, you cannot pull those up. Okay, even though they were part of the PowerPoint? We did not receive those articles, so those articles have not been submitted to the board. If the board wants to order them to be produced, that's a different issue, and then we'd have to come back for another day to allow people. Okay. But right now, they're not before you. Right. All you have is what has actually been produced. I, I think those articles, if if, mm -hmm. if I don't want to speculate, but if we pull them back up, I think they were just referencing a particular. Um, uh, I, I just have to see it again. Um, yeah, yeah, those there. Yeah. Can we make that a little bit bigger, uh, at least while it is? We can blow those up. If that's what you're talking yeah. about, Katie. yeah, yeah. So I, I think it, it was basically showing the technology 
and its effect on 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 the subcutaneous fat. So the the electromagnetic technology, which is the 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 stim stimulation we're, we're discussing, um, and, it, and its effect on the abdominal shaping, and 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 to the other doctor's point, the um, mm. the clinical physiological effect of that technology. So so the technology has been studied. You know safety and eff efficacy of the of the uh, of that um, electromagnetic uh, high intensity uh, electromagnetic that we're discussing. So, mm. and and just to the doctor's effect, the aptosis is right there. It's saying induction of fat aptosis to a non-thermal mechanism of non-invasive. So this is just basically saying that. You know, this is our technology, and these are the studies that have supported our technology in developing this product. And it's that it's safe and it's effective. So, Candy, what we can do is we can blow those images up since since it is part of the record. If you uh -huh. if that would be helpful for the panel members to review those documents, what I thought you were referencing were the actual links to other articles. There's a no, series not to articles, but to those articles themselves. Those are just the first page of the articles. Right. Can and that's we up, could we pull up the remainder of those articles? No, because that was not submitted to you. Just those pages were. Right. So unless you want to require mm. them to be produced. You can you have that ability to do that, but we would have to come back for another day because you have to allow people a chance to um, review them and ask questions about them. Well, let me ask you this, Dr. Siegel. Have there been peer-reviewed articles on this device that have been subject to review? I would say that based on what you're looking at, there have been peer-reviewed studies on the technology that's in this device. As we know, devices are name brand things, but it's really about the technology. What what is being applied to the patient? What are we what are we dealing with? We're dealing with electromagnetic, and we're dealing with low level radio frequency diathermy heat. So that's what that's what's being applied to the patient. Now we can go and research all of those articles. Not that we're going to do that, but those two. You know, wavelengths, technologies, uh, uh, whatever you want to call them, modalities have been proven to be effective and proven to be safe and proven to be. And as I've stated, they're already being used in chiropractic, you know, care. So. Uh, thank you. Well, I, I have a comment on that. So when Dr. Siegel, when you say they've been using uh, chiropractic care, They've been, you know, they've been used individually, not by in a combined fashion. And again, I, I know that uh, earlier I referenced uh, the CCE accredited chiropractic colleges, whether or not this device is being used as a teaching tool. And I believe you said no. Um, so I don't know of any CCE approved chiropractic colleges that are using this device to teach the students. I also don't know of any. Uh, testing a part of our NBC examination that tests the competency of students uh, to apply this or chiropractors seeking licensure to apply this in the into the patients. Now, um, whereas the other modalities like diathermy, infrared or electrical stimulation are being taught individually and the, the examinees are being tested to make sure they have the entry level competency to make sure the public is safe. So uh, again, if and from what I understand, you're saying that you're not aware of any schools are teaching this. Is that correct? So I, I am not aware. I, that is the that is my opinion is that I am not aware. It does mean that it's not occurring, but I am not aware of it. And um, I'm also, you know, knowing that chiropractic colleges do not teach on every device that's applied in chiropractic clinical settings in the United States. Yes, yeah, true, but the, the CCE dictates what a DCP program, what kind of medical competencies are required for a DC graduating for a credit DCP program to meet those standards. So I understand that they might not be teaching a specific device, but they have to meet those 
requirements and meeting those mental competencies required. So, um, and, I, and I would I would say based on my education and based on my continuing education that I would I would meet those competency to to use electromagnetic stimulation and you know low level radio frequency diathermy devices. Especially when they've been proven, you know, over and over as minim not minimally invasive, non-invasive with almost zero side effects. I would say I would say you have a better chance of having an adverse reaction to using a high volt machine than than you would to this machine, but that's just my personal opinion. So Hi, did anybody else have any other questions? Concerns, comments? I don't. I just have a point of clarification because when Carrie uh, 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 A.G. Colson had you pull up the document which showed the two devices and there was no mention of um, muscle uh, uh, hypertrophy as she brought to our attention. But earlier on in the presentation, there was um, information that said that muscle grew, adipose shrank, and it was using muscle contraction. So for my clarification, is that a third device or is that something that's part of these two devices that attorney Colson had had Jeff bring up a, a, a little while ago? The, there's no third device. It's just it's the it's the one device delivering both physiological effects. The muscle strengthening through do through contraction and the uh, aptosis, which would be the lipolysis and the just uh, lessening of of fat cells. Thank you. Those are the two physiological outcomes of this device. All right, any other uh, questions? Sean, did you have anything else? I don't know if we lost Sean. And I, I would just say, you know, just state. You know, no, I have no further questions. I, I'm still here, no further questions. Thank you. I just had one quick question um, that's prompted by um, Gina's question. Um, Dr. Siegel, Exhibit B that you submitted, it says what's new in 2019. Do you know when this presentation was developed? Um... I, I don't have an exact date, but I'm going to have to guess it was about a year or two ago. <laughs> so is it fair to say that this was developed um, before um, 2019 or in 2019? I would say given around the take around 2019, yep. Okay. And exhibit K that we looked at? Uh-huh. Is it fair to say that that document was prepared on January 26, 2020, based on the summary preparation date? I would say that's very fair, yes. Okay, so that came after the presentation, is that correct? Yes, correct. I just wanted to get the timing down for the board yeah, members. Like I said, the, the devices are predicated and they, you know, they, one has a bell and then one's got a whistle, you know, so it just it just kind of it, it combined the technologies, you know, so. Okay. I, I don't have any other questions unless the board does or attorney um, Lenhart, if my questions prompted any questions for you. I don't have any. Thank you. Right, so my understanding then, Carrie, our next step would be to set a date for a fact finding. Yes, you don't have, you're missing a board member, so we have to make sure that that person um, gets all the exhibits and the transcripts so they could take a look at it and review it before that date. All right. So, and the only other question is, I take it, um, Candy, you didn't want to order the production of those studies, right? Um, I 
don't think so at this time. Yeah. I don't want. Yeah. Unless there's a unless there's a um, a feeling from the remainder of the board that we want to get those. All right, well, so let's set a date for the fact finding and then uh, we can move on. Carrie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I just wanted to ask, did you want the parties to submit any briefs or proposed findings of fact to you? Would that be helpful? I think, yeah. I mean, I hate to put more work on them, but if we could um, have them submit something maybe within um, a month or six months or so, and then we can uh, set up a time for uh, uh, Pam Sawyer to review the information as well. So did you, um, what, since both parties are on the, on the video and on the series, do you want to pick a date that works with them? How much time would you First need? Thing is, what, what I would suggest is how quickly can we get a transcript of the person? Because that's going to be required in order to do the job. Um, Jeff, do you know the answer to that question? Um, generally, we get the transcripts within 10 business days. But if it would help you, uh, there is a video of this hearing, so I can uh, uh, make that available to you as well. I think I think both would be helpful, but I'll wait and hear what Dr. Siegel has to say. Dr. Siegel, did you want to uh, submit a, just basically a summary? Submit a summary uh, of, of of what we spoke about today, like a, like a like another document or something to, to no, the just board. a summary of, of your position in uh, just a conclusion on the discussions from today. And again, Dr. Siegel, I know that you, you don't practice or come before the boards very often. Anything that you submit has to be based on the evidence that was presented at today's hearing or the day the hearing before. So it has to either have been marked as an exhibit or have been part of the testimony that occurred today. It can't be anything outside of this record. Okay. Do you, do you understand that? Right. So the only thing I would say to the board is if if we had the discussion of whether or not certain states do or don't require approval for chiropractic is that something if i could research that for the board would that be helpful because i i you're, everyone's asking me these questions on 50 states that i don't know the answer to so you know uh, right now we've allowed you an opportunity to present evidence we've okay given so, so all right so you asked for a summary so i didn't know what that summary entails so i'm asking you so Right. What I'm telling you is that summary should base, be based on any of the exhibits that have been entered, whether it's a board exhibit or your exhibit. Okay. Any of the testimony that you gave today. But it cannot be based if, if the board's going to close the record out, it cannot be based on anything outside of what has been presently submitted. Okay. Well, you didn't say anything we discussed today, right? As long as it's on the record and it's part of the transcript that you're going to get a copy of or part of the recording that you have access to. So we did discuss other state applications of this device for chiropractors. We did, correct? It's limited to whatever the testimony is in the record. That doesn't mean that you can then go pull other states and colleges and submit information. Well, well somebody asked, is it allowed in any state? So and there's and there's a response in the record that you gave right now that we have allowed you an opportunity to present your case. But we're not taking new evidence. Am I correct, Candy? Yeah, that's correct. OK, so the record is officially closed right now, so there's no new evidence coming in. So okay. that means you can't go. We just want a summary of the evidence. Exactly. OK, I mean, I'm happy to provide it if the board needs it, but I think it's it's pretty much right in front of everyone what I've submitted so and you don't have to provide it if you choose not to that's fine yeah I think I think you know 
I've the the documents that I've the, all, all of the information, mm -hmm. all of the safety, all the efficacy, all of the technology is is right in front of everyone if they choose to review it for what it's worth. I think they have everything that they need to make an informed decision on whether this device should be applied for under the chiropractic scope of practice in the state of Connecticut. Okay, Attorney Lenhardt, I take it you still probably want to file something. Uh, no, if Dr. Siegel isn't going to file, I don't see any reason for CCA to file. The record speaks for itself, and we're prepared to accept the board's ruling. Uh, do we want to wait until our next meeting, which is January 20th, or do you want to do it before then? Heads up to the board. And, and excuse me, Attorney Carlson, I can also jump in. If the board wishes for mm -hmm. CCA to make the submission, we certainly will. Okay. And I didn't mean to say, no, we won't. But if okay. you wish let for us to prepare the submission. Sorry, would, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, let me ask the chair, would the chair have um, find it, or the panel, would they find it helpful to have the Chiropractic Association's position on this issue based on the record that has been developed? in doing your finding? Um, I don't think we need it, but if they chose to do it, they're certainly welcome to do that. Yeah, so so our position is that we haven't taken a position and I, uh, you know, I certainly can identify facts and, mm. and, and identify facts for the board, if that's helpful, that are in the record that would be um germane obviously to and and material is more the legal word uh to decision making if that helps we're happy to do, assist in that way and that was our role in this hearing because we haven't taken a position we we're looking to the board to um uh, advise and and issue a ruling and i think that's fine i think that speaks for itself so i mean um I have no problem with you not submitting a a closing statement. That's fine, uh, unless the rest of the board feels otherwise. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm okay as long as we get the transcripts and uh, just review this material. So I don't need any further, uh, I guess, summary of the uh, hearing today from Attorney Millenhart. Hi. So my question remains: Do we want to wait till? January 20th, or do we want to do this beforehand? And if we do it beforehand, I think we realistically have to wait for Pam Sawyer to review the information for us to get the transcripts. I don't think we could do it any earlier than, you know, probably two months from now, six to eight weeks. You, you know, you can coordinate it through Jeff if you'd like after um, this hearing, since you are missing a panel member to make okay. sure that person is available and when they're available. Yeah, that's a good point. So yeah, can I can yeah. tell you that November is definitely out for me. So if it is, it will have to be December or just, you know, just doing only a January meeting. That would be my preference based on scheduling ahead over the next couple of months. Okay. I would say December 9th would be the last date that I would like to see if we were to do this um, after if it's not going to be December 9th, then I would go to January. That's my opinion. And again, I, I agree think, with Gina. Sorry. I agree with Gina with those dates. All right, so why don't we just hold off till the next meeting, which will be January 20th. Uh, we just got to get approval from uh, Pam Sawyer, because she wasn't on the call when we set the dates for next year's meeting, make sure she's available on that date. And if she is, then we will do the fact finding uh, immediately following our next board meeting. Okay. Jeff, could you reach out to Pam? And she's available for those dates that we mentioned. Yes, I will. I will send her an email uh, this afternoon. Terrific. All right, any other things we need to clarify here before we close off? No, sure. no, I just want to thank the parties for today for um, coming back and doing a great yeah. job. So. And I want to also thank the, uh, the board for taking time out to do this. It was a long 
on time without any bathroom breaks, I might add. Yeah. <laughs> it was yes, thank, it was, thank it was, you, everyone, for uh, allowing me to present uh, uh, the information. Again, you know, I want to just do the right thing here, so I don't want to be doing the wrong thing. So I'm trying to make sure that I'm in, in uh, compliance with the scope of practice. So that's why I wanted to present this device before I went ahead and purchased it implied it into clinical practice so yeah and we appreciate that dr siegel um a lot of people would have done otherwise so kudos to you for doing your diligence i appreciate it yes thank you so uh, am i so am i needed like in january or is am i just basically waiting at this point for a ruling and that's um, my my legal duties are over <laughs> back yeah, to practice I don't think he needs to be present in january does he Sorry. Only if he wants to be, there's no requirement that anybody be present for the fact finding. Um, Dr. Siegel, what will happen is the board will conduct a fact finding and, and a decision, a proposed decision will be prepared and issued for your consideration and for attorney Moore consideration. And if you or attorney Moore Lenhart disagrees with the proposed decision, there's a method level of review uh, to the commissioner who will be issuing a final decision. OK, so we're talking sometime in January, basically. You won't be getting it. Um, they'll do the fact finding in January, but you won't be getting a decision um, for a while. OK, so because there's, there's a process. They have to draft it and issue a proposed decision, and then that proposed decision is subject to further review by the commissioner who will issue the final decision. Understood. I won't sign the purchase order until I hear from you guys. So that's why I wanted to make you like you know. <laughs> yeah. Or I'll find another state that I can buy it in. No, I'm just kidding, but <laughs> I'll, I'll see what uh, I'll see what happens. But um, but thank you very much for all of your help. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Siegel. And thank uh, you. If there's, uh, I don't know if we need a motion to adjourn here. Yes, that's no? fine. So we are all set. So thank you everybody for participating and uh, uh, we'll see you after the holidays. Have a great Thank you. Holiday. Have happy right, holidays. Thank you. Yes, thank happy you. holidays. Enjoy. Bye now. Bye-bye.